Uh, we're going to get started here. Um, the reason why we're doing this take charge is because of the buzz. All right. Now, almost every week, I get an email someone saying there's a new drug that you can take that um, cures Alzheimer's in rats or mice, and or there's a uh, a supplement that I can take, and is that work? Well, I just want everybody to realize that we spend a lot of time being aware of what's going on and um, uh, being aware of what's going on, looking at these medications. Um, now, we have two obligations, okay? We have two obligations. One is that there is a medication that is a breakthrough. We want as many of our patients who qualify to be on it, right? The second thing, though, is that if there are significant side effects and there is danger from taking that drug, we want to make sure that we protect our patients because in every one of the uh, experiments of the clinical trials that have come online, not one of them has had a positive effect on um, the outcome of the disease. So, um, so we have been given a blessing in our practice in that um, Dr. Chaconis um, actually early in his career was in charge of clinical trials for Pfizer, for the whole Pfizer company. Now, Pfizer has only lost a billion dollars in this. <laughs> <laughs> so so um, what I want, uh, I want to start with, I want to start with uh, the disease. Alzheimer's disease that was described in 1906 by Always Alzheimer. He had a patient called August Dieter who came in in 1901 and she told the doctors there that I have lost myself. She was only in her early 50s and her husband brought her because she uh, was demented. And she died five years later and Alzheimer came back to Frankfurt to do the autopsy. And that's when he looked under the microscope and saw the plaques and tangles. It wasn't until the 1980s, 1980s, that they identified that the plaques were a, a aggregate of a protein called amyloid. And the, the tangles were what are called tau. They were in the cells and the amyloid was outside the cells. So ever since that time, everybody has been trying to prove whether or not amyloid causes the Alzheimer's disease, okay? And that's the big question. So uh, we're gonna kind of get into this, uh, but I first, I, I want Eris to kind of give us a background on exactly <clears throat> what the <throat> FDA demands of drug companies that are doing clinical trials, and where are the most recent trials? Where are they in uh, the stages? Just kind of give us a little background. Thank you, Chuck. I think um, it'll become clear why why it's important to know how drugs come to be approved and then available for us to prescribe, <clears throat> because it's uh, it's interesting what's happened with the two recent Alzheimer's drugs and how they were approved. The point I'm making is that. Um, in clinical trials, there are phases, and many of you have heard of these phases that uh, drug companies go through in a heavily regulate, regulated and monitored fashion to, number one, protect the human subjects who are in these trials. There's an international consensus through Helsinki on how to keep people safe. So that's first and foremost. <clears throat> you have to excuse me, I have a bit of a congestion. But the way that the trials go, there's four phases, phase one, two, three, and four. The first phase of a drug that's being tested is usually in healthy volunteers. These are people who don't even have the illness or the symptoms of the condition. And the main thrust of that is to quickly find out, is, this, is the drug safe and tolerable? So they look for side effects and safety, and even major safety concerns like, you know, like death even. Um, and usually in those studies, 
they also are trying to figure out the dosing of the drug by doing blood tests and drug levels. And those trials are in a small group, so it's certainly not statistically large enough to make real conclusions about safety or effectiveness. Um, and they're usually um, a handful of patients. It could be like 40 patients and 12 weeks. So it's a small group and very sure. <clears throat> if it looks like it seems to be tolerable and safe and they're getting some data on the dosing, they'll go to phase two, which still is too small to make conclusions about the effectiveness of the drug. Um, but the, the drug companies will get a sense that maybe they're on the right track but they're gonna to have to do a bigger phase three trial with a lot more patients and a longer study, depending on the disease state to uh, reach the threshold where they can say this is safe and effective and they go for approval with the FDA. Um, in phase two, that could be several hundred uh, patients. Phase three could be a few thousand in the bigger studies. And phase two or longer studies, maybe months to years, and phase three can be much longer. So for Alzheimer's trials, where you're watching for a treatment effect that can take time, these trials can be a year and a half to two years for the initial um, final study, the phase three study. Um, so phase three is the conclusive study. It's the gold standard for approval, and the FDA wants that, but just to finish up, phase four is a drug is now approved and now it's being officially monitored long term, sometimes for years for safety and, and some additional information about efficacy. But the FDA has created a, um, a loophole in the system. They're very well intended. They wanted to be able to bring drugs to approval sooner based on maybe phase two data, which again is not the gold standard, because the particular drug um, offers potential benefit to people who have diseases that are either rare or are um, prevalent, but there's not an adequate treatment for it. So if we think about Alzheimer's, anywhere from 25 to 50 million people globally have it, if you look at different estimates, and I think many of you are aware of the limits to the medications we have. So through the phase two data, they can approve it uh, through an accelerated process, just like they can approve a cancer drug for a cancer that doesn't have a treatment, because maybe it will help somebody. There's a little bit more to it. If there's a biological effect, like if it can take amyloid out of the brain, uh, they will approve a drug. So they approved out at home a year and a half ago and they were approved lecanemab um, a week and a half ago based on the fact purely that it takes amyloid out without a, any consideration about effectiveness. So that's technically how that so, works. So this whole thing is predicated on the fact that if we reduce the amount of amyloid in the brain, that we would possibly prevent or cure and make the process of Alzheimer's disease better, okay? Uh, we're gonna talk about the drug uh, two years ago, uh, which is aducanumab. These both come out of the same company, which is called Biogen, um, which is a Boston company. Now, when uh, Biogen first said that aducanumab, this drug from two years ago, uh, had some positive uh, effect in that it, we could show that amyloid went down when you gave the drug. Now, they couldn't show any benefit from the amyloid coming down. They just made the assumption that when the amyloid is down, that somehow that's going to make the patient better. Well, the FDA approved it based on uh, the fact that it lowers amyloid. But the drug itself had no positive effect. Tell us what, when you first saw all of the stuff that came out of aducanumab, what was your feeling about it? Uh, well, like everyone, I think I was hopeful. I mean, we wanna have another meeting like this to announce a, break, a real breakthrough someday, and I pray we do. Um, <clears throat> The difficulty when um, Biogen and Eastside, the Japanese company, 
put that drug out for approval is we didn't have a lot of uh, published material. Usually it's in a peer reviewed journal. So we had to get sort of bits and pieces. But what they announced was that they did a very well conducted trial, but it, it was, it meant to utility, it did not show any benefit compared to placebo. So they announced it was a failure. Then a little time went by and they announced that they did some backward looking, the so-called retrospective analysis, come on, retrospective analysis of the data. And they saw that maybe in one group, there was a tendency towards slowing progression of the condition. So they kind of reassembled and asked the FDA if they could get that accelerated approval because they proved it takes amyloid out. There's been 20 drugs that can remove amyloid from the brain, and there's 20 drugs that have all failed in the past decade. We have cured amyloid in mice hundreds of times, hundreds of times. And um, stocks go up and down based on mice. Me, I'm not so keen on mice. I don't really think that they have a lot to do with how it goes on in the human brain. But we looked at the early data on aticanumab, and we, we were hoping that they would not approve it. Uh, first of all, if they approve a drug, what that does is it gives everyone hope. Our phones ring off the hook, as you might imagine. And But there's got to be... Uh, there's got to be a lot of, of, of change that if you're going to take this drug, there are side effects, and Eris is going to talk about this. But um, they came online, and uh, they wanted to charge $56,000 for one year to take a drug that showed no benefit at all. We were incredulous that they would approve it. That We want to see the data where all of a sudden you start testing people and they test 20 or 30% better having that amyloid come out of their brain. None of that was there. When it didn't work, they decided to drop the price to 28,000, okay? <laughs> the question is, is Medicare, that's a big thing on the, um, we'll talk about that in a minute. So um, tell us about, <laughs> Uh, okay, let me explain uh, MAB at the end of a drug. That means it's a monoclonal antibody. A monoclonal antibody is something that is developed that is Pac-Man, okay? And it is um, structured to attack a certain protein combination or a protein profile. So this is, when we put this in, we have Pac-Man, and it goes and eats the amyloid. That it eats it. And you can see the amyloid in some people going down. Okay. Now, um, we started this with the question is, uh, is amyloid, does it cause Alzheimer's? Well, clinically, um, there is a, um, a scan that we can do that shows amyloid in the brain. It's called Amavid. Uh, and there's a drug uh, called Flobetapir that attaches to amyloid. And so it lights it up. Well, I can take two identical scans of amyloid in the brain. Okay, we can put them up side by side and I can show you that both of them have the identical amount of amyloid in the brain. This guy here on the left is in a nursing home and the guy on the right is teaching physics out at UNCC. There are times when we can have a patient that we have diagnosed with dementia or, amyloid, or Alzheimer's disease, and we do um, a amyloid scan, and it's got no amyloid on it, but they have Alzheimer's disease. So you see that there's some question about the premise. Now, no one wants these drugs to work more than we do. Our, our patients that they are approving it for have mild disease. So tell us about the side effects. And all drugs for Alzheimer's disease are first tested in people with the mildest of symptoms. The, the reasonable theory is that the brain has not been irreparably or irreversibly damaged. Um, and therefore a drug has a better chance of working in someone with the mildest of symptoms. 
later on, the company may, once that's approved for, for mild symptoms, they may go on to test it in more advanced illness or disease. They did that with Aricept or Dinepazil. It was first tested in mild disease, then later it got the indication for moderate or severe um, Alzheimer's disease. <clears throat> so that's where all that was coming from. So to your point, many of our patients have the earliest and mildest of symptoms, and many are still independent with that mild cognitive impairment. So the question is, would we be doing much more harm than good? Because we don't know as we're giving this drug and time goes on, should we keep giving the drug every month into the coming years when a person's worsening or is there a point where we should stop it because we have chosen to give it? But the, um, the shared risks of these monoclonal antibodies that effectively remove amyloid from the brain are principally around an infusion reaction because it's an injection in either a doctor's office or infusion center where people can you know, have the usual um, reactions, uh, nausea, vomiting, dizziness, uh, some people faint from it, uh, <clears throat> or some more serious consequences because this antibody, this monoclonal antibody is getting in your bloodstream, getting into the brain, and it's inflaming, essentially, it's attacking that amyloid, as Dr. Edwards said, and it's assisting our immune system in removing it. This is an, technically an inflammatory immune response. <clears throat> and if you inflame normal parts of the brain as a consequence of that, you can get edema, which is salt water that builds up in the brain and swells the brain, and a person can get symptoms from that. You get confused and very weak. In its worst situation, you could go into a coma. But it also inflames blood vessels because amyloid can be in the blood vessels, not just the brain. And when the medicine is taking the amyloid out of the wall of a blood vessel, it can leak and bleed. And so collectively, the swelling and the bleeding showed up in 21%. That's almost you know, a quarter of the patients in this latest drugs safety monitoring. Now, admittedly, that those, most of them were found to have the swelling and bleeding by MRI scans because they had to monitor the patient's brains to see if this was happening. But the patient never felt it. There wasn't any detectable symptom from that. However, uh, almost 3% had serious complications from the bleeding and the swelling. Now, 3%, that's 3 out of 100 may not sound great, but when you have a dubious benefit, even if the drug were free, and you have that potential risk, it does concern us. And just to add some additional information, um, there were 13 deaths in this last lacanabap study out of 1,700 patients. Again, that seems low. Half were in the placebo group and half were in the drug group. But how the people in the drug group passed away, there was no revelation, no uh, information given by the drug company. But three of the patients' families got the information from the medical record and had independent reviews done because the drug company was not giving details about this. And that that kind of that concerned us very much. And those three people died as a direct consequence of the drug, not from something else like the placebo people. So we we are very careful to your point about first we want to protect our patients. Uh, secondly we want we want to help them. Um, so one of the things that these drugs do is that the approval makes everybody have this false hope. And it is, so we are extremely sensitive to this data that we want them to show us that um, there is significant improvement to have the risk of dying from this, okay? Um, all right, Eris, tell us, tell me about um, the uh, lecanemab and what is supposed to be different about lecanemab when the aducanemab was such a disaster for the FDA? How have they changed? And what did that drug show that the aducanemab didn't? Yeah, and both of them do a good job of removing amyloid, as we've said, uh, from the brain. 
there may be a difference in lecanemab in the fact that it attacks something called protofibrils. These are like early smaller pieces of the big plaque in addition to attacking the big plaque. So maybe it's better at preventing plaque from forming and also removing the big plaque. And that's a conjectured or surmised difference in this drug compared to some of the others. Um, but the, the this is where it gets, uh, please tell me if I'm getting in the weeds here. The measure- You're always in the weeds. Yeah, yeah. it's okay. The, you're right. That's why we love you. Thank you. <laughs> the, the measure of effectiveness in a clinical trial tends to be, um, in half the trials, is purely statistical, meaning they can show a statistically significant difference in the treatment group on the drug versus placebo. We ask, well, statistics are nice, but what does that mean clinically? We call it the minimally clinically important difference, the MCID. That's sort of the buzzword. Like, so, you know, if they said, and they said this in the Lacanamet trial, that it will slow the progression of someone with Alzheimer's by 27%. Well, when I heard that before I read the study, I thought, well, Whoa. this is more than we've ever had. It's, it's almost 30%. So that at the time they measured it, which was at 18 months, a year and a half, the people on the drug were 27, well, the people on placebo were 27% farther progressed than the people on the drug. Well, <clears throat> it turns out that the company used a very standard measure of um, cognitive ability and functional day-to-day -day ability called the uh, clinical dementia rating, some of the boxes. It's an 18 point scale. It measures memory, judgment, um, it, uh, orientation. It, me it measures uh, a, a person's ability to do things in the community, hobbies. Uh, it measures personal care. So there's a cognitive yeah. measure and a functional measure. And on average, on that zero to 18 scale, you want to be at a lower number. On average, your number increases by one point on that scale every year. Um, and the people in the trial, both the placebo group and the people in the drug, were about a, a number four. At a year and a half, the people on the drug went up to went up by about. Uh, let's see if I get the numbers right. They increased by a smaller amount. It was 0.45 point. In other words, and, and to put it in perspective, uh, 0.45 point difference at a year and a half, when all the experts said, if you use that scale, you have to at least achieve a one point delay in mild cognitive impairment or nearly a two point delay in mild Alzheimer's. So they didn't even reach the threshold of the consensus of where this would be clinically meaningful, but the drug companies calling it uh, very statistically significant. And then they use the term 27% reduction. So we figured out that this is not meaningful, certainly not worth the risk. To give you an idea on this is that when they gave it accelerated approval, that means that they went around their, their safeguards and a consensus statement was signed by 200 Alzheimer's researchers, many of whom consulted for the company, all right? And they declared that it was a foundational game changer. Press reports have described the results of the clinical trial as momentous and possibly the beginning of a new era. One of the major people said, Dr. Ronald Peterson at the Mayo Clinic, found the results pretty impressive and said, it was modest clinical response. And then this is where it didn't stop the disease and it didn't make anybody better. Not that it was supposed to. Now, I got a problem with that because if I'm gonna take a drug that's supposed to make me better and I've got a chance of dying from it, I wanna know that it's gonna help me. So you see, we, we want this to work, but we're not willing to risk um, our patients early on in this we're going to see what happens. Uh, there are a um, a group of uh, 
like questions here that people have asked. I'm going to get Harris to um, read a couple of you got me. I do. Um, and then you ask me one, and then I'll ask you one. Okay. But I just want to make the final point of this. But there is um, a lot of controversy around Babylon, <clears throat> and that the only significant clinical trials that have been approved by the FDA have been against amyloid. And so there is a growing group of outrage by saying, where's the other experiments that need to be done on things that aren't predicated on amyloid? And there are lots of different theories, but we're not seeing any of that data come out or that these hot clinical trials in anything but amyloid. Um, so I just want, uh, we want this to work. Uh, we, we follow this stuff very closely. Um, so that's, that's where we are. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, read some of these questions that y'all have. And, um, and I, let me make one more comment about this approval. How the Helm is approved and the Canamab or Lequembe is the name now for it is approved. It's approved provisionally through this accelerated pathway. And if you read the package insert that you would take out of the box, all it talks about is taking out amyloid. It doesn't talk about any effectiveness data, which means that CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, is not obliged to pay for this drug under the provisional approval. Uh, they're obliged to pay for a drug when it's been fully approved at a phase three, not a phase two level. So when the FDA approves these drugs, they say to the drug company, Mr. Biogen, Mr. Esai, you have to continue to study it, come back, show us the goods that we can fully approve it, or we will take away the provisional approval. What's odd is they told Biogen they gave them nine years to come back and show it, whereas most of these studies you would show it within a year and a half to two. So it's all very odd. Uh, but here's what all of us in here, we're the final decision makers. Adahelm has been a commercial disaster for Biogen and Esai. Cooler minds prevailed. All the families and patients in this clinic understood this is, was not really a drug to be given, even if it were free. And I think we're starting to feel the same way about Lecanemab. We've had a lot of questions from people. And we're gonna, yeah. uh, okay. why, why don't you uh, take the first ones? Okay. Uh, cost and available, availability question. Will you be offering it? Again, obviously, we're in a holding pattern. By the way, it's not even going to be available for a while. Right. Anyway. And Medicare is not going to cover it. Not going to cover it. Number two, um, Imagine the cost of this nationally and globally, if it's 27,000 a year, two effusions monthly, and the cost of that, four to five MRIs a year. It's estimated that to give people with mild dementia from Alzheimer's or mild cognitive impairment from Alzheimer's, the sheer numbers will put the cost in the trillions. It would break the back. Right. We'd find a way if it really worked, but it doesn't appear to work. So how long before we know if Lequimby would be covered by Medicare? Again, it, Medicare will cover the cost if it's in a clinical trial. So they'll pay for it if the, uh, they keep studying it, but they won't pay for it outside of a clinical study. Um, so these are not available now. Um, All right, side effects. Uh, this is a kind of an off of the thing, quetiapine. Uh, quetiapine has a black box warning on it. It's an antipsychotic. Um, a typical antipsychotic, or what it's called, and uh, there's a black box warning. There was a very large study of 2,000 patients that when they took quetiapine, uh, that uh, or any of the atypical antipsychotics, uh, there was an increased incidence of stroke, heart attack, um, and uh, they put the black box warning. Several studies have come after that, which didn't bear this out. But we don't have any other drugs to use when our patients become psychotic. So we'll always tell you that the black box warning is there, but we've got to use it. We've got to use quetiapine when our patients get psychotic. When Risperdone, give you an example, um, I um, had a uh, that uh, had a gun collection, and his uh, daughter and son-in-law 
were in the basement uh, and he had the delusion that his son-in-law was having an affair with his wife, okay? So what am I gonna do with this, all right? So I put him on Risperdone and that delusion goes away, but yet there's a black box warning, but I'm gonna use it because Here's a guy with a gun collection, and his son-in-law is not going to make it. All right, so we use we use these drugs sparingly. We don't like to use them, but if someone is agitated and in trouble, we use them. But we always explain to the patients and the families that that there's a black box warning on. Um, what are the pros and cons of the new drugs in regard to side effects? We've already gone over that. Um, this person says, I'm very concerned about brain swelling. This does not sound safe enough to go ahead with a new drug for my husband. Plus, you are exactly right. Okay. All right. Go ahead, Harris. Uh, the next two questions about research. Uh, current medications and studies deal with plaque, the amyloid plaque. Are there other long-term studies dealing with other aspects that's of brain a, therapy? That's perfect. Isn't that the answer? That's a great question. That's right, because we've been mired down in this quest to... Uh, prove amyloid as the main target or the main cause. You can look this up. Uh, the Alzheimer's Association, I think, annually prints a summary of the research. It's taken from clinicaltrials.gov, the website that you can look up all clinical trials. Essentially, uh, as of last year, there's 145 compounds or drugs being tested in 170 plus um, trials for Alzheimer's. 80% are for disease modification, meaning it's not just treating symptoms like 10% of these drugs being studied, but modifying the disease, slowing progression, protecting the brain. Um, and then another 10% are for some of the psychological symptoms like depression and psychosis that can occur. Um, some of the new targets are like going after tau, that's the microtubule associated protein, that when it gets hyperphosphorylated, it breaks down and the cell dies. You see that in several of the dementias. So there are other targets, not, not to worry, but hopefully if we put to rest this amyloid obsession, more, more uh, attention and funding and publications would be for new drugs. Like it. We, we did have some, um, we had several of our patients participate in a trial um, um, on a drug that was called T3D 959. And um, we saw some, uh, it's a drug that enhanced uh, the metabolism of glucose by impaired uh, neurons. And we saw in several of those patients some rather dramatic effect early on, especially in language. Uh, we saw people with expressive aphasia be able to communicate better. So, but we've seen very few of those studies that have alternative. Um, etiology. So we're interested in doing the clinical trials, but we just have to protect ourselves. All right, this next this next group is all about uh, supplements. Like, do you have any feedback or comments using lion's mane? Uh, to he's some of them. There's a um, um, a uh, a neurologist that lives out in California. His name's Dale Bredesen, and um, he has uh, like 19 supplements that he gives people. And one of them is lion's mane. Um, uh, he promised us uh, a, uh, a large clinical trial to prove that his supplements were helping patients. Uh, he promised that um, five or six years ago. We haven't seen it yet. He did write a book called The Prevention of Alzheimer's, where he, uh, he um, but he's got to back this up. Um, there are no supplements. There are no supplements that have shown any um, improvement, uh, uh, anything slowing the disease uh, or uh, preventing the disease or any positive effects. So uh, we recommend vitamin B12 because patients who are vitamin B12 deficient um, will have um, a lot of CNS symptoms. And we also recommend uh, vitamin D but we don't have any data to show that vitamin D, um, we know that people are low on vitamin D, but there are no symptoms that they show. And so therefore giving vitamin D 
Um, we just know that people use sunscreen all the time now, wearing big hats, and their vitamin Ds are low. And vitamin D is a hormone that's at the base of a lot of physiological uh, processes, so we recommend it. But Prevagen, none of those work. They got another one about a guy that says, oh, my brain and this, this will do, all these things will do, make you think clearer. It's all fraud. All right, so brainstem, I, um, none of that, okay. Are any of these drugs being recommended for those with a family of Alzheimer's? There are some studies down in South America. There is a group of people in Colombia that there, there are certain genetic, genetic profiles that they're called autosomal dominant. If you inherit the gene, you're gonna get Alzheimer's. They are... Um, Alzheimer's precursor protein, presenilin-1, and presenilin-2. So there's a group of, of uh, people that get premature Alzheimer's disease in Colombia because they inherit the gene presenilin-1. If your either parent has it and you, and you get that gene, you're going to get Alzheimer's. So it's a perfect place to study. So I think it's Willie. I think it's Sola. Uh, I'm not sure. But... They now have started these families on the, the monoclonal antibody toward amyloid before, at, just uh, as part of, um, they don't have any symptoms, they're young, they're in their 30s, and they're normal, and they've studied it. And then in about probably 10 years, we're going to find out whether or not attacking the amyloid is going to prevent the development of the disease. It's going to be very interesting. But that is a study that's going on right there. Um, answer the next one, uh, Eris. The news on the Canamab about that. Um, let's see. Is that under general? Yeah, general. It's down to the second one. Um, oh, yeah. We, we talked about this 27% slow in cognitive decline. What does that mean? What we kind of. You get that. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Um, can you help us understand the profile that Alzheimer's patient might be best suited for this drug? Again, it was in the mildest of forms of the drug. Um, and I may say this to your point about the family, uh, the folks down in Medellin, Colombia, they're, they have the gene, they're going to get Alzheimer's. They're the perfect group to study in advance of the symptoms. So they're they're laying down amyloid even when they have no symptoms because we know you can find amyloid in the brain of someone destined to get Alzheimer's years, many years before, maybe out to 15 or 17 years before. So um, it's the perfect time to see if lecanemab or aduhelm, if you prevent the accumulation before symptoms, would that deliver something meaningful? Because as amyloid is created in the nerve cells and starts to clog up the connections between nerve cells and the other cells around called microglia go in to remove the amyloid, the, the microglia get overwhelmed after a while. And so amyloid keeps messing things up. The maybe the other targets is the way to go. But um, anyway, sorry. Go. Current experience with aducanumab, it's been a disaster. Okay, no one's using it. Um, um, we wanted these th drugs to work, but uh, they really messed up on Atacam Mav. You know what we emphasize, because you know there's a lot of discussion about what can we do as the children of parents with Alzheimer's if that if our risk is higher, doesn't have to be our destiny. But there's a um, in the journal Lancet. If you Googled the uh, prevention of dementia in Lancet. It's kind of an overwhelming article, 70 pages, but what they really are emphasizing is what can we do until there are treatments or drugs to modify our own risk? And you hear this a lot. I mean, the discussions about lifestyle changes, you know, treating high blood pressure, obesity, hearing loss, treating depression, diabetes. Don't wanna have a sedentary lifestyle. You gotta have good sleep because it cleanses the brain have to have a good education early in life and so forth. Aerobic activities don't be socially isolated. I mean, it's, it's kind of a nice playbook on what we could do. And it's probably never really too late to do these things. But I, they probably go a little too far in assigning a risk percentage. And if you were to change all of these things, you might reduce the risk, personal risk of getting Alzheimer's by up to 30, 35%. They do say that that's kind of unproven. 
but it does give you a playbook on healthy litter and the things that may be seen as more common in people that get Alzheimer's unless you uh, change the evil of our ways. One of the things that has been most impressive for me, now I have a little bit of bias because of course, you know, I dealt with arteriosclerosis for 40 years, now. but uh, there was this amazing study uh, done um, uh, in the uh, uh, 1946 uh, in a small town outside of Boston called Framingham. It was the Framingham study. And what they did is that people were dropping dead, especially after World War II, because it was so traumatic. You know, every day you didn't know whether a loved one was going to die and stuff. And so people were dying, dropping dead because of stress and everything. So in you know, this town of Framingham, they went in and said, we are going to control the cardiovascular risk factors and see if we can lower the death rate. So they started to get people not to smoke. They started lowering cholesterol. And at that time, they didn't have statins. So they give you this horrible stuff called cholestyramine that um, you may go to the bathroom once a year. I'm going to take it. And they started to drop cholesterol. And the one thing they did is they got very aggressive about treating blood pressure. And so in the decades, the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 2000, 2010s, you can see the incidence of cardiovascular deaths go straight down. And all of what we know now and what we're doing is uh, uh, controlling those risk factors and the incidence of coronary death and all that are dropping, okay? Um, so then they went back and looked at the incidence of dementia in these same populations for the 70s, 80s, 90s, and 2000s. And what do you think? That the incidence of dementia went down on that same slope as cardiovascular risk factors. If I can control one thing to prevent someone from getting um, uh, dementia, not necessarily Alzheimer's, but dementia, it'd be to control their blood pressure. So, uh, so there are lots of factors here that are playing in. Um, uh, and so, but uh, we do not want our patients, our patients' families uh, to get genetic testing, okay? To find out that you have a genetic predisposition for a disease that there's no treatment for doesn't really do you any good. We want you to have a healthy lifestyle. We just don't want you to carry that that sword of Damocles sitting over your head for the rest of your life, because what's that gonna do? It's gonna increase your stress and you're gonna be terrified that you've got it. Also with this APOE testing, that they think that they know what uh, APOE is a genetic, uh, that, that they feel like that if you inherit APOE4 from one parent, that that increases your lifetime risk of getting Alzheimer's disease to about 27%. In the general population, it's somewhere around 18, 20% if you live long enough. So, but they say two covers that you inherit APOE4 from both parents. We don't really know. The literature would say that, oh my God, you're gonna get it, it's 90%. But that's not true. There are a lot of people who are having autopsies now that have APOE4 that had nothing to do with Alzheimer's. So the genetics aren't worked out to the point where we want you to uh, get genetic testing. So, so it really doesn't have to be your destiny if you have those genes to get. You don't necessarily. You no, know, if you do have the autosomal dominant, the PCL1 and 2, you're going to get it. But uh, right, any questions from the people here? Any Anything else that... Um, Melanie, is there anything uh, else? Yeah, the there's chat? a couple in the chat here. Whether these same potential drugs may help someone with Lewy body dementia. Ever since 1901, when that poor lady, August Dieter, came in to the clinic in Frankfurt and was taken care of by Dr. Alzheimer's, there's not one thing that has been developed that will affect the disease itself. Okay? We are exactly the same place today as we were in 1901 when she came in. Now, we are much better at controlling the behavioral issues, the depression, the apathy, 
uh, the aggression. We're good at that. Okay, that's what we do here. But the, that incidence, that's why it's so important for us to be able to look at all kinds of different etiologies for this. Um, one of the things that's happened in DLB, dementia with Lewy body, uh, is characterized by four things. It is they get hallucinations and they see people and animals in the room with them. They know they're not real, but they are real to them. They're the same people in the same animals each time. Um, so they actually will name them or know who they are, or they'll, they'll, it's, it's amazing, okay. The second is, thing that they get is what are called inattention spells, that you'll be talking to them and they will just go off. Sometimes they're so profound that you can't shake them out of them. They may last for five minutes, they can last for 30 minutes. They're, they're um, amazing. The third thing is Parkinsonian symptoms. 25% of people that get dementia with Lewy body won't have any Parkinson's symptoms at all. And then 75% will often develop progressive um, symptoms. And the last thing is that a lot of them will develop, develop what's called REM behavior disorder. Each of us, when we dream, when we go through rapid um, eye motion sleep, we are paralyzed. We can't move. It's probably evolutionary because if you're flailing around or something, people don't want you around too much. My wife would want to do that. She values her sleep. Uh, but uh, but uh, red behavior disorder, the uh, uh, patients will develop it if they develop dementia with the body. And there's an amazing drug that's been developed called Nuplasic. So we are, you know, we're making some inroads, but uh, there's nothing that is going to uh, there's no drug that is going to reverse the Parkinsonian um, damage to the uh, cortex, which is the um, pathological um, defect in dementia with Lewy body. Anything else? Question, what research has been done to confirm or deny that, to confirm or deny that amyloid is the issue? For example, perhaps amyloids might be the byproduct of something else causing Alzheimer's. And to that end, is there other drug research ongoing that focuses on other causes of the disease? Yeah, well, clearly, I mean, amyloid, there's a physiological amyloid, which is like a necessary amyloid protein. Then there's the pathogenic amyloid and the nerve cells of our brain that live in the outer mantle, the cortex, are constantly making amyloid, metabolizing it. So when we get the bad amyloid, it's gone down the wrong metabolic pathway. and it's okay to do that a little bit because the other nerve cells that are not the ones for thinking called microglia or like our immune system in our brain, they'll scavenge the bad amyloid that's blocking the connections of the nerves. Um, so, I mean, it, it makes sense to me that uh, early on, we would think that as that's accumulating and it's there we're under the microscope, can, can we make them better if we, diminish the amyloid or reduce it or remove it. So we have all these studies that have not successfully told us that. So we're increasingly of the mind that once you have symptoms of the disease, it doesn't help to attack amyloid. Maybe it does when you're younger and accumulating amyloid before you get symptoms. And maybe that would be something we'd give early on. But I think a lot of us believe as more targets are successfully identified that might play a role in producing uh, Alzheimer's disease that will be on a cocktail of medications, two or three drugs that are targeting different things at different times in the course of the disease. But it's the brain. Brain research is exceedingly complicated. It's really hard. So I'm not surprised about how many viewers plus it has. One of the things that may come from this, which is good, because if you if you take it in the right way, something leads you down the wrong way or it doesn't work, you learn as much um, uh, or almost as much as it's a success. And I, I make one final comment. We've really set the bar low in a highly prevalent and disabling disease that we've made little progress on, like Aricept and, you know, Exelon and Galantamine and Mamantine. They're all drugs to help improve symptoms without impacting the disease. If you look at those clinical trials, they show a statistical benefit compared to placebo in mild and some more advanced stages, but they never 
and often don't show a meaningful clinical benefit. So we've accepted the statistical analysis and prescribing of drugs for years. That's why they're hyping lacanumab is this amazing breakthrough, because once again, we've accepted a statistical benefit and not necessarily a clinical And one benefit. final point that I want to make is that if you, um, our philosophy is, if you have some mild memory loss, and we are really good at, at focusing on what we have left, not what we've lost. We still have patients that are very functional and have value to their life. And so that's why we're talking about this today. Okay.